Good morning, everybody. I don't know about you guys, but sometimes I wish they'd just keep playing that. I mean, you know, those are always, those are always good clips. My name's Scott Ford, and I'm uh, filling in for Tim Lundy today because Tim Lundy's, you know, sick of bed, apparently. We, we have an update? Is it really? He's swine flu, whatever that is. He's got the flu. Was he going to live? Well, he's expected to live, so that's good. So we got that going for us. He should be back next week. Well, hey, Pete. How you doing? Good. Uh, I love this. Uh, I love that line. You know, what was it exactly? My heart's for my family. My brains and my balls are for business or whatever that was. I don't think that was the point of the clip, but that was the part I latched on to. <laughs> My family's here, all three of my boys. I've never had all three of my boys here. Sam, Joe, and Will, y'all give them the hey, hey. Yay. They're all in town. It happened to be that they, they could all line up and we're going to get to go to one men's fraternity together. So that's kind of fun. All right, Russell Rainey, uh, you had the flu when we came back from Rwanda. You going to talk about that today? You're not? Russell Rainey, here's when I came to got, I got to know Russell last summer uh, when we went to Rwanda together. There was a bunch of us. And, uh, and I, I, he's kind of got this quiet, you know, easygoing way about him, but you kind of learn that there's something underneath him that's, that's uh, very, very hard. And uh, he'd gotten sick, and, you know, that, that's part of it. And we're like, you know, you know, here, take some Imodium AD and, you know, shut up. And, uh, you know, it'll all be better in a few days. And uh, we get to the airport somewhere where we on the flight back either in Europe or Cincinnati or someplace and he goes over and lays down behind some chairs and goes to sleep for two hours and we get to the next place and he goes to sleep and we're like Russell you know this is this is this is a uh, you know this is the mild stomach crap and he goes yep it's no problem it's no problem and we're like you know he's really sick though and he's kind of white and pasty and he's kind of white and pasty anyway he was really white and pasty <laughs> and and we, it was obvious that he wasn't feeling very good and we get back home, and it's like, uh, did you hear about Russell? Oh, uh, yeah, Russell got the tummy bug. He goes, no, Russell almost died. What? No, he had an infection. And they said if he'd gone to sleep instead of the doctor to get the IV or whatever he got, that he probably would have just, his liver had already turned pepsid or septic or, what was it? Yeah. Is there a doctor in the house? <laughs> what does your liver do? Turn raunchy. <laughs> and... Uh, and they said he had died. And I said, my gosh, I got a lot of respect for him. He never whined. He never moaned. He just laid down to sleep. So I'm willing to listen to a man talk about real-life adventure if he's willing to almost die and not complain about it. Russell Rainey, come on. <laughs> oh, my. Yeah, I didn't have the energy to complain. Well, Scott's not the best nursemaid in the world to have going for you, um, <clears throat> but he does give you a good motivation. Hey, it's good to be back with you guys this week. Welcome to session two of The Great Adventure. You made it back, and I know we got some new guys here this morning. You know, when I talk to some guys about the highlights from this week, the overwhelming highlight, it was really kind of amazing. It was like y'all had gotten together and orchestrated just coming to me, was all about the small groups. I had one guy come and say that, man, he was glad to be back in a small group. He hadn't been with a group of guys since last year's men's fraternity, and it really felt good to be back there again. I thought, well, that's great. And, and then I had another guy come, and he said, man, it was really good to be in a small group. He said, you don't know how good, because I haven't had a group of guys that I felt like are really pulling for me since I was in high school. And that was over 20 years ago. And I went, man, this stuff really is good. And then I had another guy come to me. It's like I said, it was like y'all just orchestrated, who said, my small group was amazing. And I don't think you understand how much, because in my entire life, I have never had a group of men that I thought were on my side. <clears throat> And it was a powerful moment. And it just reminds me again, that the real power here is men being with other men, just trying to be better men. We all struggle at that. You know, the other highlight from the week that I heard from guys, I even heard some more of this this morning, um, was just my dancing. Clearly, y'all enjoyed my little Mission Impossible dance. I was even hearing talk of a, a YouTube comeback for that thing. So I'll have to, to unleash some more of that just raw talent on you again. <laughs> later this year. 
Well, this morning, rather than start by giving you just a whole lot of words describing the great adventure, I want to give you a picture, a picture of what it looks like when a guy actually lives out the great adventure. This picture is of the 26th president of the United States of America, Theodore Roosevelt. And I know a lot of y'all may think you know his story, but listen here to just a few things from his life. You know, as a young man, both his mother and his wife died on the very same day. And after that tragedy, he left to go explore the American West, where he became a professional cowboy and a professional big game hunter. And he said that was very transformational for him because that's where he learned how to, how to do life with other men. There were guys who were rough and tumble out there and he learned how to get along and to work alongside other men. It was very formative for him because in the Spanish-American War, he recruited a bunch of these rough and tumble guys, a bunch of wild misfits. He recruited and trained them and they became known as the Rough Riders. And then he led them in their famous charge up San Juan Hill. Throughout his life, he led rugged African safaris and deep Amazon explorations. And some of those, kind of like my trip to Rwanda last year, almost killed him on more than one occasion. After William McKinley was assassinated, he became our youngest president ever at age 42. As president, he busted powerful business monopolies that threatened to destroy our country's economic freedom. And as president, he boxed with sparring partners several times a week in the White House until one blow detached his left retina and left him blind in that eye. <laughs> he then took up jujitsu and continued his habit of skinny dipping in the Potomac River <laughs> during winter. Late in life, after being shot in the chest in an attempt, uh, assassination attempt, he refused medical attention until after he gave his 90-minute speech. He just reasoned that since I wasn't coughing up blood, it must not have punctured my lung. I'll be fine. He ended his life. For the rest of his life, he carried that bullet in his chest. He is the only man to have won both the Congressional Medal of Honor and the Nobel Peace Prize. That's diversity. What an adventure he lived. But don't think that it came easy to, be, to him because he had a very unlikely beginning. As a child, he was puny and weak and asthmatic. He had to sleep in a chair or slouched, uh, kind of uh, propped up in the bed for his entire childhood. So much so that his ailments and his asthma were so frequent that he couldn't go to school. He had to be homeschooled. But in the face of these gray obstacles, he refused to yield. On his own, he began a regimen of physical fitness. He started this as a young boy. He called this his life of strenuous endeavor. So that after years of this struggling, he was able to compete in college in both rowing and boxing. So how did this frail, sick boy become our greatest presidential adventurer? How did he go on to become one of our greatest presidents of all time? When you read the rankings that historians do of great presidents, he always ends somewhere around in the top five, kind of in there. His face is carved into Mount Rushmore with George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, and Abraham Lincoln. So how did he do it? Listen to this great quote from this great man because in it, he tells us how he did it. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man in the arena whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who knows the great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at best knows in the end the, high of tri the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who have never known neither victory nor defeat. What a great quote. Did you hear him tell us how he did it? 
Did you hear him tell us how he overcame his weaknesses to become a great adventurer? He tells us he did it by being a man in the arena. No guaranteed wins, no playing it safe, no matter what, he got in the arena. Now, these are not just some empty words of a romantic idealist. This is a treasure map to the great adventure. A real live, hold it in your hand, X marks the spot treasure map to the great adventure from a man who has actually been there. And he's telling us that the treasure we seek is in the arena. I do want to welcome again those guys that are here that are new this week. We're glad to have you. And just to try to help get you up to speed and everybody on the same page, I just want to have three flashbacks to last week. Flashback number one, life for a man must be more than responsibility. I'm not advocating irresponsibility, but life has got to be more than a series of do's and don'ts. Or eventually, we suffer from three realities. Reality number one, too much responsibility can wear a man out. The saying, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, is true. Patrick Morley writes, you know, I have worked with men for more than 20 years. If I were to make one observation about men, it would be that everywhere I go, men are tired. Not just physically, but emotionally, mentally, spiritually. They are tired, exhausted by life. Ed Seisman puts it this way, men past 40 get up at night, look out at city lights and wonder where they made the wrong turn and why life is so long. Man, that's depressing. Is that you? Too much responsibility can wear a man out. Reality number two, too much responsibility can pull a man down. A man can simply buckle under life. Some of the signs of this are emotions that we don't fully understand, especially anger. Some men, and I've been one of them, can just erupt into anger out of nowhere that we don't understand. Some guys express it in sadness. They just brood about life. Others become fearful. They know something is missing, but they just don't have the courage to do anything about it. In the movie Parenthood, there's a great scene where Steve Martin finally cracks under the pressure when his wife tells him that she's pregnant again. Watch this. I'm really happy about the way things are turning out, aren't you? You know, with the frame of mind you're in, not only am I not sure we should have another baby, I'm not sure we should keep the three we've got. Well, I'm ready to discuss it. However, I can't right now because i got to go to Little League. Ten little boys are waiting for me to guide them into last place. You really have to go? My whole life is have to. Come on, Kevin, get your glove. Ann, did you hear that last line? My whole life is have to. Is that you? Too much responsibility can pull a man down. Reality number three, too much responsibility can set a man up for a serious fall. We get under too much pressure for too long with too many responsibilities and we begin to look for a way out. Maybe it's addictive behavior like pornography or alcohol or drugs. Maybe it's just escaping to a new life. I saw a lot of this in Jackson Hole. When you live in a place with a very high fantasy value, you'll see a lot of men who have just chucked it all. The wife, the kids, the job, they've just chucked it all for a fantasy. They thought that they could go somewhere where life would be better. They thought, thought that they could find a life that was just free and fun. They thought wrong because it was a fantasy and they found out quickly it was a lie. And then there's the affair. So many guys fall into this, not for the joy of sex. That's not why they're doing it and losing their life and their family and their reputation in the process. They're doing it because life has become so burdensome that they just want an adventure. They just chose the wrong one. Is that you? 
Too much responsibility can set a man up for a serious fall. Flashback number two, life for a man needs to be woven with adventure. You know, in the outdoor world, one of the miracle fabrics is called ripstop nylon. It's a super light fabric that's also super strong. It allows gear to be made, um, you know, lighter and stronger and just has more function. And the design is very simple. It starts with a, just a gossamer light fabric. And then it weaves, you'll see a picture in here. I hope you can see it well enough. They weave these reinforcement threads in in a crosshatch pattern. Now, if you have something made out of your tin or your sleep bag or something's made out of the nylon without those reinforcement threads, if you get a snag in it, it just tears and destroys a piece of equipment. These reinforcement threads stop the rip, hence the name, rip stop. And that's the way adventure works in a man's life. We've got to weave adventure into our life because we get stretched pretty thin at times, thin enough to tear and be destroyed. We need to weave adventure into our lives to make it ripstop. Weaving adventure in our, into our lives means avoiding half-life manhood. Half-life manhood results from living out of balance with either too much responsibility or too much irresponsibility. Too much responsibility is where we put our head down and work hard. And we believe if we get it all done and we get it all under control, life will feel right. And all it ends up being is responsibility. And the last thing in the world that feels like is right. Do you know at the Nazi concentration camp at Auschwitz, over the main gate, there's this big sign that says, work makes you free. What a lie that was for all those Jewish prisoners who walked through that gate, read that sign and thought, work makes us free. We just need to work. It was a lie then and it's a lie today. Work does not make you free. Now at the other end of the spectrum, staying a boy doesn't make you free either. Being irresponsible, living life below the belt, being self-absorbed and just your own wants and perspectives. That doesn't make you free either. That'll never feel right. Betting your life on responsibility or betting your life on irresponsibility both end in the same way. They both end in half-life manhood. What we need is a life balanced with purpose and calling and fit and fun and energy and destiny. That's what we're going to do together this year. We're going to weave a balanced life. Balanced by a sense of purpose and calling because we're in pursuit of a cause that is greater than us. Balanced by a sense of fit and fun and energy because that's what makes us come alive. And balanced by a sense of destiny because we know why we're here and where we're going. Flashback number three. This adventure we are exploring is new territory for most men. That's actually good news because men love exploring new territory, which means this is a great time to be a man. We are in an age where what else is a growing question for men and self-management a growing need. One of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century, just a truly modern man, was a guy named Peter Drucker. And Peter Drucker put it this way. Peter says, in a few hundred years, when the history of our time will be written from a long-term perspective, it is likely that the most important, important event historians will see is not technology, not the internet, not e-commerce, it is an unprecedented change in the human condition. For the first time, literally, substantial and rapidly growing numbers of people have choices. For the first time, they will have to manage themselves. And society is totally unprepared for it. That's a great quote that's part of a, a larger article that Peter wrote called Managing Oneself. I'll have that entire article up on the website later today. I think you'll enjoy reading that. We are all pioneers here. 
I love that. Being a pioneer is exciting. And, and our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren are all going to benefit from us having the courage and the perseverance to pioneer a new way forward. Last week, I talked about the importance of facing the three big hairy questions of life. Remember? Who? Why? Where? You know, we all face big hairy things in life. For some of us, the big hairy things we face in life are men. For some of us, the big hairy things we face in life are women. Sorry. <laughs> for some of us, they're creepy. And for some of us, they're legendary. But most are just plain scary. You know, on my first a trip to Africa, I came upon the biggest, hairiest, scariest thing I'd ever seen. I was in Rwanda and we had gone to see the legendary mountain gorillas. You know, the ones that were made famous in the movie Gorillas in the Mist about Diane Fossey. Not only some of the most amazing creatures on the planet, but some of the rarest creatures on the planet. They all live in this mountain range, this Virunga mountain range. It has uh, over se more than seven 14,000 foot peaks. In fact, the tallest one's right at 15,000 feet. It's, this, it's equatorial rainforest way up in the high country. Just an amazing place. It shares part of this area is, is uh, Uganda, part of it's Rwanda, the Congo. And when you want to go see the mountain gorillas, the first thing you do is you go to the park headquarters and you meet your guide. Don't we love guides? And the guide tells you, first of all, about this group you're going to go see. They have these different groups that they allow people to go see. And the group is always known by the silverback gorilla. There's in the group, there are young males, there are lots of wives, there are lots of babies. And then there's one silverback, the king. Now, most of his duties throughout the day are sleeping and eating and lots and lots of sex. It's good to be the king. And when you, just before you're leaving the headquarters to head on your hike to try to track these gorillas, the guy takes you over and shows you this display. It's a brilliant display, and there are these carved wooden boots, life-size. And then there's this wooden board, the seven-meter-long wooden board, marked off in one-meter increments, one, two, three, all the way up to seven. Seven meters is about 23 feet. On the other end of the board, there's this uh, life-size carved wooden gorilla. And the clear message here is, you don't get any closer than seven meters to that gorilla. It's a great way to do it, you know, because they have people from all over the world coming there every day, a lot of language barriers, and they want to convey this because it's dangerous, both you and the gorillas, if you get too close. In fact, I even thought, man, I need to do that for climbing. I need to make kind of a little cliff and then have like a mannequin at the bottom of it just kind of all mangled with blood and stuff on him. And, and then right before I go climb and take my clients over and go, don't do that. Okay, sorry, back to the story. Um, so we set off. In fact, our group, when we saw that seven meters, we kind of thought, no problem. In fact, that's pretty close. Ten meters would be fine with us. A couple guys said, yeah, and I got a zoom lens. I'd be okay with 20 meters. No problem. The seven meter rule to us was no problem. But there was one problem. Nobody had ever told the seven meter rule to the gorillas. And when we got in their group, we found out that they were very comfortable being much closer than seven meters to us. And when they would come closer, we would, the, the guide would just say, back up, back up, and back up. Well, very quickly, we were completely encircled by this group of gorillas. One of the wildest things I've ever done in my life. And, you're, and all you can do at that point, the guy just says, sit down. And so we just sit down and we're watching the show and babies are coming up to us and mamas with babies clinging to them are coming up to us. And then there's the silverback. 
and I'm just videoing. I got my video camera going, and it's on full wide angle. I'm getting back as far as I can just to be able to see these things. Because we could just reach out and touch them. They'd brush by us. It was an amazing experience. And then this kind of ruckus started, and we didn't really know what was going on. But the favorite food of the mountain gorillas are these little bamboo shoots that are just sticking out of the ground about this far. And then they pull them out, and they're quite long when they get them up out. And it's their favorite food. And, and I guess the way it works in the, the mountain gorilla family is when you pull one up, you're supposed to take that and offer it to the silverback. So one of the wives did that. She took the bamboo shoots, but rather than offering it to the silverback, she started eating it. And he noticed immediately and came over there and grabbed that bamboo shoot and stuck it in her mouth. Now, all this is going much less than seven meters with, with us, just a little bit uphill, really close. And he puts the thing in his mouth and he grabs her with both hands and he starts giving her a little what for. And well, rather than describe it further, let me show you what it looks like when a silverback mountain gorilla lands at your feet in kind of an angry mood. Watch this. Yeah, Don't worry. Keep taking the picture. Look there. Keep, keep, don't worry. Yeah, yeah. See that guy? Now our guide tells us that this is the largest silverback gorilla known to exist in the world. Well over 500 pounds of big, hairy, and scary. You know, when you come face to face with something that big and hairy, it definitely gets your attention. And facing the three big hairy questions of life, that should get our attention too. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? We can't ignore these questions. We can't say, oh, they just can't be answered. That's the coward's way out. We can know the answer to those questions. The, the question is not, can they be answered? The question is, how can they be answered? And they can be answered in one of three ways. Way number one is that they can be answered by guesswork. We can all guess our way through life. We can guess about who I am and why I'm here and where I'm going. Many men choose this way, but unfortunately the track record's not that good because most men, guess wrong. That's how I started out in life, just guessing. Out of arrogance, ignorance, I thought I was smart enough to guess right, to just figure life out on the fly. I was wrong. The second way those questions can be answered is by cultural conformity. Rather than guess, we can look around and say, what answer does everybody else have? You know, kind of like in school, when you look over on somebody's paper to get the answer. In fact, let's do that. Let's look over on the paper of cultural conformity and see how they answer these three questions. The answer our culture gives for who am I is, I'm a biological machine. It acknowledges my physical reality. It agrees that I do exist, but only as a biological machine. The answer our culture gives for why am I here is I'm here to experience more than the other guy. So if I hear of somebody doing more than me, I feel bad because I think I should have what that guy has and even more. And I should do what that guy does and even more. I just feel bad. The answer our culture gives for where am I going is... I am a man going somewhere completely unknown. It says that you just can't know where you're going. Then it goes on to add this curious assurance. But wherever we're going, it will be somewhere great that I'll really enjoy. Unless I'm a bad guy like Hitler or something. What? That's nonsense. I have no idea where I'm going but I'm going to really love it. That's just the full-on poster child for stupid. <laughs> Give me a break. After I gave up on guessing my way through life, 
I turned to cultural conformity for answers. I thought I would just follow along. That seemed like a good idea. Once again, I was wrong. And lastly, these questions can be answered by age-old wisdom. Throughout history, these three questions have been asked and successfully answered. We call this wisdom. Wisdom is the secret of life. But where do we get it? In his book, Why Religion Matters, Houston Smith tells us where. He says, the winnowed wisdom, a great phrase, the winnowed wisdom of the human race is found distilled in the world's great and enduring religions. Great religions take all of life and boil it down to some truths that we can understand. It's the best of the best that has stood the test of time. Now, when religions write down this wisdom, we just simply call that scripture. And it, the best-selling book of all time just happens to be a collection of scripture. We call that book the Bible. So I want to take the Bible, this great collection of wisdom, and see how it answers those three big hairy questions of life. Now, I know when I pulled out the Bible, all kinds of feelings just entered the room. Some of those feelings were positive, and that's okay. Some of those feelings were negative, and that's okay too. Wherever you are right now, and how you're feeling about the Bible, that's okay. Remember, this is a safe place. But I wanna be crystal clear on how we're gonna use the Bible in here this year. First of all, we'll use the Bible to lift us up not to beat us down, because the Bible is never intended to beat us down. It's a book of life, not a book of death. Using the Bible to beat people down is just wrong. It was intended to give life, not to take life. Second, we'll explore what I cover the, call the Bible's three cover-to-cover -cover purposes. The first cover-to-cover -cover purpose is about an epic tale. You know, we all feel deep in our hearts that we're living in a story that's bigger than us, a larger tale. It's kind of like in the, the movie Lord of the Rings. It's this great epic tale where there's a place where Sam turns to Frodo kind of after, they, after they've stumbled into this amazing adventure. And Sam turns to Frodo and he says this. He says, I wonder what sort of tale we've fallen into. We've all felt like that. Like we just walked into a movie 20 minutes late and we can clearly see that something important is going on. We just have no idea what it is. In fact, we can't even tell the good guys from the bad guys. From cover to cover, from cover to cover, the Bible reveals this epic story from eternity past to eternity future. And what's more, it tells you exactly where you are in that story. Kind of like the the you are here thing. Whenever you have a map, you need to know where you are, like at the mall or an airport and you're lost and you go, I need to find the map and you are here. The Bible clearly tells us where we are in this epic tale that we've fallen into. That's an amazing thing. The Bible's second cover to cover purpose. From cover to cover, the Bible tells us that God is passionately pursuing a relationship with us. It's a great thing. And then from cover to cover, the Bible contains great wisdom about how to win in life. So let's look at some of this wisdom to see how you answer the question, who am I? The Bible answers, I am a man created by God. You know, that question is so important that God put it on the very first page. Listen to how he says it. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. He says it three times on the very first page. And it's not just Christianity. Every major religion shouts this same truth. You are a man created by God. Answering, I am a man, is just not enough. Life will never work that way because life will never be bigger than you with that answer. 
I am a man created by God is where the adventure begins because that's when life finally becomes bigger than you. There's a great proverb that says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Now, the fear of God here doesn't mean that being, af uh, about being afraid of God because he's going to smote you somehow. That's not it. The fear of God here simply means this, that God is who he says he is. And on the very first page of the Bible, God clearly says that who he is is the creator of us. That's the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning of the great adventure. Now, I know some of you guys aren't there yet, and that's okay. Remember? This is a safe place. So how does the Bible answer the question, why am I here? It answers, I am a man commissioned by God. Right after God creates man, in the next sentence, still on the very first page, God commissions man with these words, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And then he goes on to tell man to enjoy all the very good things that he's created. God is commissioning us to three specific adventures. You have a diagram in your workbook that breaks down these three adventures. Let's take a look. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth is our commission to reproduce life, which is our family adventure. Subdue the earth is our commission to fight for a better life, which is our noble adventure. And giving us everything good is our commission to enjoy life, which is our man adventure. Now let's look at the row there that's the family adventure and finish that out. The family adventure is not where a guy thinks his role is just to earn money and give it to his, to his wife so she can raise the kids. The family adventure is one in which a guy sees that within his family lies an incredible purpose. And that purpose is to launch out of his home a healthy and noble next generation. And that can't be done as some dry duty with the last of our energy at the end of the day. That needs to be an adventure. The who of this adventure is your wife, which is why learning how to be married well is crucial to the great adventure. And guys, if you hadn't cracked that code or you're not on your way to cracking that code about how to be married well, just contact me. I will be glad to get you some resources because guys, the code has been cracked. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's not a mystery, okay? Don't let it be that way. The key words are understand and involved because we need to understand what we're trying to do and we have to become involved. We can't do it from a, a distance. We have to become part of the adventure. The outcome is legacy and joy. Listen to this statement from the Bible. I have no greater joy than this, to hear of my children walking in the truth. That's what God meant when he said, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Not just fill the earth with people, but fill the earth with noble people. A big part of my life over the last 10 years has been helping men discover this family adventure. Most men didn't have a father who lived this family adventure out with them, so they have no idea that it even exists. They have such painful memories of their family growing up that they can't believe that there could be an incredible source of life there, source of joy there. But there is. What a great day when a man wakes up to this reality when he finally discovers the excitement that awaits him by becoming a real father and becoming a real husband. Let's look now at the noble adventure. The noble adventure is where we fight to make the world a better place by discovering a cause that is greater than us. The key word here is fight. That's what subdue the earth means. It means to fight. Now, whether fighting comes natural to you or not, you are still called to fight for something that is noble and greater than us, greater than you. The who of this adventure is your team. 
One of the absolutes about your finding your cause is finding your team. How could you ever succeed at a cause that is greater than you by yourself? That makes no sense. As a friend of mine would say, that's just stinking thinking. We have to have a team. The key words are calling and purpose because this adventure fits your unique design and your unique purpose. The outcome is energy and satisfaction because even in the heat of the battle, you're energized at your very core and it brings you amazing satisfaction. Now, before I finish with this noble adventure, I need to uncover a lie. It's the lie that says it's heroic to take on the world alone. That's crap. That's not heroic. That's what insecure men do. Real men learn to fight alongside other real men. This is, this is a life and death truth that hit my family personally. When my son was in high school, his best friend's dad committed suicide. He took a shotgun, put the barrel to his chest, and he pulled the trigger. I remember at that funeral, it was a dark time, and my son had, had spent the last few days with his friend and his friend's family, and he came to join my wife and I at the funeral, and he was already crying, and he sat down, and I just kind of looked at him, and, and, and he just, all he could say was, he's just so sad, and he started sobbing uncontrollably. It just permeated the whole church, and it broke my heart. After the funeral, out in the lobby of the church, I had some tables with memorabilia out there from his life. On one table, he would have been a good carpenter. On one table, they had a, his tool belt and some pictures of some of his uh, woodworking that he had done. He was an avid hunter, and so on another table, they had a, some of his guns, and they had some pictures of, of trophies that he had killed, big game. And then on another table, it had the books and the music and the movies that he loved to watch and listen and read. And that's when it hit me. Every single one of those celebrated the lone hero, the guy who can do it on his own and he doesn't need anybody else Movies like Rambo and Zorro and, and his favorite song was sitting right there propped up, the little case. It was Desperado. Remember that old tune from the Eagles? Cautionary tale about the lone guy out riding the fences. You better let somebody love you before it's too late. And he bought that lie. And life got hard he had a, a terrible relationship with his dad, an incredible amount of pain there, and that made life hard. He struggled with alcoholism, and that made life hard. He struggled to be married well, and that made life hard. He struggled to raise these two incredible teenagers that he had, and that made life hard. So hard that he got tired of looking in the mirror, because when he looked in the mirror, he saw a guy that couldn't do it on his own. And he said, real men do it on their own. And if I can't do it on my own, I don't deserve to live. So he put the gun to his chest and he pulled the trigger. And he destroyed a family. And I say that because, guys, there's some men in this room right now who have either bought that lie or you're at the checkout counter right now buying that lie. Real men don't do it on their own. Real men have the balls and the courage to get with other real men to do life. And if you don't learn that in one way, shape, or form, that lie is going to take you out. All right, let me see if I can switch gears here. Let's do the man adventure. This adventure is where we explore the world and challenge ourselves 
I've had a bunch of these man adventures over the years, and I plan on having a whole bunch more. I love climbing a mountain or running a river and exploring a wilderness with some guys that I don't care if it takes a month or a week or a day, just as long as we're out there pushing the envelope together. I know men who have joined together on a quest to play the highest rated golf course in all 50 states. And they did it. Now, they had to sneak onto a couple of those to actually do that. I'm not advocating that sort of behavior. That's just what they had to do to get it done. Get her done. I know men who have sailed around the world together. I know men who have built an airplane together and then flown it across the country. I know men, well, I think you get the point. The point is that these adventures are not to be read about in a book. These adventures are to be lived. The who of the man adventure is your mates, other men who you love sitting around a table with, thinking over the possibilities and asking, could we really do this? Do we have what it takes? Are we tough enough? Are we courageous enough? Are we crazy enough? That's the thrill. A guaranteed win isn't the thrill. You got to stretch the rubber band far enough that it could actually break. Guys, hey, listen to me. You got to pull the trigger and ride the bullet. It's my team. If you guys don't know what just went on there, read your email this week. The key words are explore and excite because exploration with other men is exciting. The outcome is fun and memories because these adventures give us memories that we love to tell over and over again as we laugh until we cry about the misadventures that we've had along the way. Guys, those are the adventures we're commissioned to by God. The family adventure, the noble adventure, the man adventure. And we'll discover and pursue all three of those this year. Now, I want you to write down a key statement because it guards against a major stumbling block. Your job must be a means to a life, not just a living. We can easily allow our job to kill all three of these adventures. Your job must be a means to a life, not just a living. So we'll have to evaluate if our job is doing this. But listen to me, you can't do that valuation alone. It's just too powerful, too close. You won't make a good evaluation. We need the help of other men who want to see us win in life. You know, like the guys in your small group. It's a great question to evaluate together. So how does the Bible answer the last question? The where am I going question. It answers, I am a man who will ultimately face God. Now that brings us full circle. I'm created by God. I'm commissioned by God. And eventually, I'm going to face God. Do you know that the central claim of every major religion is the same? Every major religion's central claim is this. We know how you can finish your life in a right relationship with God. In one way, shape, or form, that's what they all say. Because they all realize that if we're created by God and we're commissioned by God and someday we're going to meet God, then we want to be in good standing with Him when we do. Don't we? Don't you? I sure do. When I meet God, I want to be right with Him. We've got to talk about that. You can't just ignore that because ignoring that ignores a huge part of the great adventure. But talking about that, as important as that is, talking about that will have to wait for another week. Let me close this morning with a poem from Edgar Lee Masters entitled George Gray. I have studied many times the marble which was chiseled for me, a boat with a furled sail at rest at the har- in a harbor. In truth, it pictures not my destination, but my life. For love was offered me, and I shrank from its disillusionment. Sorrow knocked at my door, but I was afraid. 
Ambition called to me, but I dreaded the chances. Yet all the while, I hungered for meaning in my life. And now I know that we must lift the sail and catch the winds of destiny wherever they drive the boat. To put meaning in one's life may end in madness, but life without meaning... Life without meaning is the torture of restlessness and vague desire. It's a boat longing for the sea and yet afraid. Men, we are all boats longing for the sea and yet afraid. But this year, this year, we face our fears and we set sail together. Scott? You were a poet. That was great. That was great. Give him a hand again. I... You can tell that Russell has put an enormous amount of work and preparation, something that Lundy and I knew nothing of, uh, into coming and talking to you guys this year. And uh, I just, I really appreciate it. It's, uh, this has been terrific. I'm, I am really looking forward to it. You know, I've never been to this, this third session of men's fraternity. So one of the reasons that I'm not leading, other than I got fired for cussing, was, <laughs> it's a joke. Uh, <laughs> Uh, is that I've never been through this section. I'm really looking forward to it because this is hitting me in life right where I am. I mean, you know, I mean, boy, I could tell you all that stuff, but you'd be late and you'd miss out on small groups. So we'll do all that another day. Tell you about what's going on with me at the appropriate time.